Vielen Dank. Danke Ihnen allen vom Austrian Economics Institute und dem Hayek Institut. Es ist schön, in Österreich zu sein. Ich freue, ich freue mich sehr über Ihre wunderbare Einführung und die herzliche Begrüßung. Ich Ich bin voller Demut wegen Ihrer großen Ernennung für meine Arbeit. Ich möchte auch noch sagen, es sind zu so viele herausragende Gäste hier. Und ich kann nicht jeden Einzelnen würdigen. Aber danke Ihnen allen, dass Sie gekommen sind. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, this evening we gather to celebrate the legacy of a brilliant thinker and economist, Friedrich Hayek. But if we are honest with ourselves this evening, we also gather at a time when Hayek's ideas are viewed with some suspicion and they actually risk being relegated to history. Here, of course, we understand the power of Hayek's insights. But elsewhere, Hayek's dedication to limited government and free markets is, frankly, no longer in vogue. In many ways, Hayek's influence amongst policymakers and economists is waning. I see at least four reasons why this is the case. First, as the global economy emerges from the worst financial crisis in over half a century, government intervention rightly deserves some credit for the recovery. Second, nations such as China have demonstrated that governments can drive economic growth and development. In just one generation, China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty by embracing economic policies that firmly place the state at the heart of the economy. Third, demographic shifts, especially in the West, are promoting the massive buildup of a state-centric economic environment. Aging populations across Europe and the United States have come to expect that their governments will provide an ever larger social safety net Thus, the role of government will only continue to grow in turn. And fourth, extremists on both sides of the economic aisle have hijacked economic thinking and wielded it as a weapon in political fights, diluting and distorting the meaning behind economic ideas in the process. This divisiveness has widened the chasm between competing schools of thought when we should be building bridges between them as a basis for policy discourse. Nevertheless, in spite of a popular temptation to rele relegate Hayek's ideas to the past, I believe that his thinking is more important than ever, and that over time, the global economy is at risk of losing its moorings without Hayek's philosophy providing it balance. So this is what I would like to discuss this evening, my view of the world and the myriad of ways of thinking that Friedrich Hayek, the Nobel Austrian laureate, is indispensable. But I would first of all like to begin by speaking about another Austrian Nobel laureate, Wolfgang Pauli, who earned the Nobel Prize in 1945 for his pioneering work in the field of quantum mechanics. Pauli was nominated for the Nobel Prize by his friend Albert Einstein, arguably the most famous scientist of the 20th century. And yet Pauli and Einstein contributed competing ideas to the field of physics, ideas that have not been reconciled even today. Pauli, as many of you know, was among a cohort of scientists that discovered the mechanics of the smallest particles of matter 
that con constitute basic building blocks of the world. Einstein, on the other hand, offered a dazzling new way of understanding the universe itself. He described for us the heavens tightening our intellectual grasp on the mechanics of the planets and the stars. For nearly a century, numerous scholars, including Pauli and Einstein themselves, have attempted to unite these two very different fields. They have searched for what is called a theory of everything that brings the inconceivably small and the unimaginably large into a grand synthesis. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the search for that theory continues. I believe that there's an analog in our work as economists and as policymakers. In many of our policy-oriented conversations, economists and policymakers tend to retreat into rival camps organized around competing ideologies. On one side, there are thinkers who often draw ideas and inspiration from Dr. Hayek and others from the renowned Austrian school. We believe, we know, that limited government and free enterprise is the path to liberty and prosperity, to free markets and to free people. On the other side are those who tend to espouse the theory of John Maynard Keynes. Keynesians argue that government has the capacity and the responsibility to solve many if not all problems. By their logic, government spending can grow any nation out of economic difficulty. Government, they contend, should play a significant role in spurring aggregate demand and driving an economy to full employment. As I mentioned, increasingly, this view seems to be gathering momentum and shaping economic policy around the world. The problem is, this Hayek versus Keynes debate is a simplistic binary way of seeing the world, and it establishes a false choice. The question, which of these two ideologies do we rally around, may in some circles constitute an interesting theoretical debate. But in practice, the better question is what sorts of policies help to incentivize growth that supports human rights and economic liberty? The answer, I believe, must draw on both schools of thinking. Indeed, as in with physics, we too should be searching for a unified policy, unified theory of economics. Ladies and gentlemen, this, is at the exploration, this exploration is at the core of my work. I believe we need a more balanced outlook on economic analysis an alternative view that equips us to address the two defining economic challenges that we face today. The first of these challenges is restoring robust growth in Europe, the United States, and around the industrialized economies. After a period of mounting debt, the prospect of challenging demographics and stagnating productivity. The second challenge is maintaining robust growth in the developing world, as a period of unprecedented economic expansion clearly has begun to slow in some places and regress in others. As I see it, these two problems, restoring growth in the developed world and maintaining it in the developing world, share the same root cause. They are both symptoms of the same pathology. And the underlying malady is the old age, age old debate, the imbalance regarding not just the size of government, but also the role of government. Citizens rightly and reasonably expect three benefits from their governments. And I would argue that these are largely uncontroversial. First, governments are responsible for providing public goods, such as national security, um, education, and essential public infrastructure. Second, governments are obligated to punish illegal activity and to step in when markets don't clear. Third, and arguably most importantly, however, 
government must provide the necessary incentives for people to work and thus create sustainable economic growth, reduce poverty, innovate, and lay the foundation for political stability. When it comes to this third obligation of creating incentives, Hayek surely would agree that too many governments in too many places today are doing a wholly unacceptable job. They've created systems that are not only failing to incentivize their citizens, but worse than that, they are in fact disincentivizing free markets and free peoples. This is true in both developed and developing countries. Let me elucidate. Consider the circumstances in which we find ourselves in the industrialized economies. If viewed through the lens of capital, labor, and productivity, the three key ingredients that drive economic growth. During the past 50 years, as I have written, deliberate policies have eroded these three crucial factors. And while they have been driven by good intentions, such policies have yielded disastrous outcomes, leaving the West in the precarious economic situation in which it finds itself today. As German Chancellor Angela Merkel pointed out earlier this year, although Europe is just 7% of the world's population, it produces 25% of the world's wealth and it accounts for 50% of the world's welfare payments. Worse still, if we include the United States in this calculation, we find that 12% of the global population is receiving 88% of the world's welfare payments. This is clearly unsustainable. Moreover, political myopia embedded in developed democracies promises even a more burdensome government. In particular, the nature and regularity of elections in many developed democracies encourages policymakers to very rationally focus on instituting policies that drive and provide short-term inducements to their electorate so that they can get re-elected, despite the longer-term detrimental consequences to society. Entitlements and benefits are being offered in a manner and in a scale that adds to the inefficiencies of government. In his work, Hayek cautioned that such expansion of government can promote bad outcomes in the political sphere and at the very extreme could lead to authoritarianism and totalitarianism. The objective of creating and maintaining growth across the developing world also requires better conceived and better deployed incentive systems. Yet policies like foreign aid that have dominated the international agenda over the last several decades have clearly led to broken incentives and weaker political and economic environments in aid recipient poor countries. While I have written extensively about the deleterious costs and consequences of foreign aid in emerging markets, let me briefly explain here why aid policies have damaged the political infrastructure and undermine the possibility of creating functioning liberal democracies across the rest of the world. Think for a moment about how democracy works in well-established economies. There is an implicit democratic contract that exists between governments and their citizens, where in return for paying taxes, the government provides a suite of public goods to their citizens, education, national security, etc. If the incumbent fails to deliver on his promises, then he's voted out of office. Put in another way, he's driven by the desire to stay in office. The government is incentivized to deliver public goods. However, in a world where foreign aid replaces the need for government to depend on tax receipts, governments again very rationally spend their time courting and catering to their donors rather than caring about what their constituents want. We see this happening across the developing world. In essence, aid severs the connection between citizens and their governments and damages the veracity of the democratic contract between them so that their governments are not accountable to their people. 
once again we see the destructive pattern where deliberate policies not only disincentivize governments from doing the right things, but they directly incentivize people to do the wrong things. The result is corruption and the kind of democracies we see far too frequently in the developing world. Democracies in name only, where leaders routinely fail the very people that they purport to serve. Democracies that can in practice be worse than the authoritarian systems that they claim to replace. Ladies and gentlemen, according to Freedom House, a think tank in the United States, today 70% of the world's democracies are illiberal democracies. The underlying problem in both developing and developed nations is quite simply bad incentives. The common solution, therefore, must be that we should be embedding policies with good incentives. This is the cause to which we must commit ourselves, developing and embedding the right incentives into public policy making. And on that score, we can do at least two things. For one, conditional cash transfers, where cash and welfare payments are made conditional upon the receiver's actions. This can surely um, ensure a strong safety net while incentivizing behaviors of citizens that are economically and socially productive. Incentive-driven policies are already being used in countries such as Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, the Philippines, and even in the United States. Conditional transfer programs that pay or reward households for children meeting school attendance requirements, receiving immunizations, choosing to go and study mathematics and sciences, or meeting health-related targets, such as reducing cholesterol or weight to combat obesity, have all delivered notable success. Now, the notion that the state should be paying people to do things that they should want to do anyway will no doubt seem radical, if not unfair. But ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. Public policies must be embedded with positive incentives so that individuals are induced to make choices that will encourage them to pursue the benefits for the whole economy for the longer term. In addition, government, politicians, and policymakers themselves need to also be correctly incentivized. Which brings me quickly to the second intervention that we should consider. An overhaul of the electoral systems so that political cycles better overlap with the long-term econom economic hurdles that incumbents are facing, such as declining education standards, degradation of infrastructure, that have put industrialized economies on their perilous path. For example, extending term limits and political cycles for, could, for example, have policy, politicians are only allowed, where politicians are only allowed one term, but for a longer period in office, as in the democracies of Mexico and Brazil, might be something worth thinking about. Such an overhaul would, would root out political myopia and correctly incentivize policymakers to focus on resolving the longer term challenges facing the West rather than as it is now, where incumbents very rationally spend their time implementing short sighted, mostly expedient policies, albeit with long term effect, negative effects for an economy. In a nutshell, political reforms can help us realign incentive structures in a way as to help strengthen both democratic institutions and policy outcomes. I believe that Hayek would very much agree with this assessment of the world we live in today and with these incentive-based prescriptions. And yet I don't discount the work of John Maynard Keynes. Quite the contrary. Keynes provides a model that has predicted what we have seen around the world. The ability of strong but small central governments to act effectively in times of crisis. Keynesian policies clearly can boost aggregate demand, put to work underutilized resources, and clear markets that won't clear themselves. These policies are not a panacea, however. We need a more balanced approach, a more Hayekian approach. Much like Pauli and Einstein, we must seek a unified theory of economics. After all, Keynes read Hayek and wrote, I agree with almost all of it. And Hayek read Keynes and wrote, 
it's reassuring to know we, almost, we agree so completely. These seminal thinkers, these architects of the discipline of economics, they both understood the need for balance. They would have both understood that we don't necessarily need more government to solve our growth problem in the developed world. We need better government. They would have both understood that we don't necessarily need less government to solve our growth problems in the developing world. We need more efficient government. If we can move past the stale doctrinaire approaches of yesteryear, if we can create the right incentives, then we can lay the groundwork for growth in both economic environments. And ultimately, we can spark and sustain the engine of growth that drives higher living standards and expands political freedoms everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how we can best honor Hayek the scholar, not Hayek the caricature. Hayek the man, not Hayek the myth. And, and it is in this spirit I am humbled to accept this honor in his name in the service of his legacy and of yours. Thank you.